some of you who might be less familiar with Peter Singer might be thinking, what was Kat's comment about earlier? He's the godfather of EA. Who's this guy? Okay, so he gave um, a TED talk recently, which you might have come across, about the effect of activism movement. But he's been involved for ages. He basically kick-started this whole thing for a lot of people. Um, he, I've met so many people who have said that, uh, you know, how did... When I asked them how they started off, what's their EA story, a lot of them say, oh, I read Peter Singer. And it's the same for me as well. And when I first started out, uh, I was just looking for fellow Peter Singer fans. Like, there was no term EA. Um, I didn't yeah, know about any, a lot of these groups didn't exist. Um, and so he was, like, the core of who I was looking for. So for decades, Peter's been writing about, um, like, animal ethics. Um, he's often called, like, the founding father of the um, founding father. That's a state part of um, the, like, the founder of uh, the animal rights movement, and he's been writing about global poverty. Um, and now in his talks about effective altruism, he often says, uh, you know, been writing about this for a while, and it's only just in the past few years that this has kicked off. So he's got a lot to thank you guys for, and I'm sure you've got a lot to thank him for as well. So I bet you're all very excited to meet each other. And um, just the a final thing, I remembered a quote that I heard once from a Christian as a warning to another Christian, said, be careful, you'll like him. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a lovely guy. Okay, so with that, I give you... Yay! Uh, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, which I caught most of. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be in touch with you this way. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in San Francisco with you, but it's a long way away, obviously, from where I am now. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what you've already been talking about. I understand that you've been talking about effective altruism over the weekend, um, and I don't quite know what you've already said. So that's one disadvantage of just coming in this way, that I may go over things that you already know um, and uh, may not pick up on some themes that I would have liked to pick up. But um, for that reason, we have, uh, we have about an hour, maybe um, an hour and five or ten minutes, um, so uh, I'd like to just talk for a relatively short part of that and then I want you to ask questions or make comments so that we have a discussion so you can tell me what are the things that you want to hear from me or want to get my views on um, while we have this chance to talk and I'd also like to hear from you about what your interests are. Um, and uh, uh, you know, where you feel the effective altruism movement is going because I do think that it's something uh, new and exciting but very much still forming and therefore uh, at an early stage of the movement you have a chance to contribute to its direction in a way that's uh, quite significant. Uh, so um, I'll talk a little bit about building the movement and some of the issues that you might want to think about in regard to that uh, in, in, a, in a few moments is part of what I want to say. But um, So let me begin by saying, and you may well have had this, um, I think that uh, effective altruism is a new movement which essentially combines the two elements that you'd expect from the name. It uh, combines the idea of helping others altruism um, and the idea of doing that effectively or in the most effective way that you can. So another way of expressing it would be to say it's about trying to make the world a better place but it's about not just trying to make the world better but trying to make the world as much better as you can given the limits on your resources whatever they might be or perhaps you could say given the limits on your altruism because uh, very, very few, if any, are 100% altruistic. Um, I certainly don't consider myself to be anything like that. Um, I spend time doing things that are not directed towards making the world as good as possibly can, but with the time and money and other resources that I do devote to that, uh, I want them to be as effective as possible. I don't want them just to, to make some sort of difference I want them to make uh, the biggest possible difference uh, where I can do that. So that's what I think the movement is about. Um, in one sense, you might say, well, 
what's really new about that. We've had charities for a very long time. We've had people giving time and money to trying to improve things. Um, that's certainly true. But um, uh, the emphasis on doing that effectively is, I think, something that is relatively new, not completely new. And the idea that this ought to be a part of everyone's life I think is also something that is, again, not, not totally new, but at least neglected, um, quite severely neglected um, in, recent, in recent decades. So what I mean by that is um, the ethic that is still most broadly accepted out there in the community is that what's really important in living ethically is that we don't violate certain rules, that we don't cheat, steal, uh, kill, maim, um, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, and um, I think effective altruism has a different view that says that if you want to live ethically, it's important that um, you use at least some of your time and resources to make the world better. So it's trying to say that if you're going to be living an ethical life, you need to be um, doing something reasonably significant to make the world a better place. Um, assuming that is, of course, that you have the, uh, the resources to do that. So if, you know, if we were talking about everyone in the world, you might say, well, this doesn't really apply to a lot of people. Um, they have to spend all of their effort simply to feed themselves or to look after their family. But um, effective altruism is really addressed to people who do have uh, extra resources beyond what is required to meet their basic needs. So it's primarily addressed to the uh, billion or so affluent people in the world um, who have more than enough, much more than enough, to um, meet our own basic needs and, in fact, are spending a lot of time and a lot of resources on uh, things that are in no sense meeting our needs, but are luxuries or frivolities of, of one sort or another. So that's why I think um, effective altruism makes a difference to the prevailing morality that's out there. Although you could easily say, for instance, especially if you're, um, if you're a Christian or if you're t talking to Christians to try to persuade then be part of this movement, you could easily say that it's, it's going back to the message of the Gospels and indeed the message of uh, the earlier Christian church, which um, you, know, you can find plenty of, of statements saying things like um, that uh, to, feed, to feed the hungry if you have an abundance is not, um, is not simply an optional thing to do, but is a duty that, uh, in fact, in uh, views like, like Thomas Aquinas that uh, you don't actually have a right to property that is in abundance against somebody else who is starving. So if you have more food than you need and someone is starving and that person takes your food, they're not even stealing. They're just taking what they have a, a natural right to. So, yeah, you can find uh, these sorts of ideas uh, going back a long way, but certainly, as you would know, living in the world today... Um, most people don't think that, and so it's really important that we put that message out to people to try to change that idea, to try and say, look, um, it's really important not just to do no harm, but to do good. And in fact, in some cases, that may be more important than doing no harm if you do a much greater good. So um, let me say a little bit, since I come at this from an ethics perspective, obviously there's different ways of coming at this, let me say a little bit about some of the values that um, are part of this movement that lie behind it and you can think about these and think about whether you agree with them or don't agree with them and to what extent. And um, there's a little summary of those, by the way, in um, a, a blog that Holden Karnofsky has on the GiveWell website. I presume most of you have heard of GiveWell by now. If not, um, you certainly should be spending some time at givewell.org, um, website that assesses charities relating to uh, helping the global poor, but also has a lot of other interesting discussion. And uh, this was a blog that Holden put up 
uh, on the 4th of April of this year uh, called Deep Value Judgments um, and Worldview Characteristics. And um, uh, essentially, I agree with the kinds of things that he's talking about. I think we, we share a lot of values. So he says um, people involved in effective altruism are uh, cosmopolitan or global humanitarians. That is, we're generally not concerned particularly to do good uh, in the immediate area where we're living or in some other particular segment or slice of humanity that we might identify with, you know, people of my ethnic group or uh, my religion or whatever it might be. Um, we're concerned to do good generally. Um, now, it may be that you feel that you can do more good locally because you know much better about what's going to happen there and what will make a difference. That's an empirical question. That's possible. But it's not... It, it, it's not because they're people in your community. Um, it would have to be because you, your dollars actually somehow do more good there than they do elsewhere. But generally speaking, I think, of course, that's, that's not the case given the huge differences in wealth between where we live and where some of the world's poorest people live. So um, effective altruism is cosmopolitan or globally humanitarian. Um, another critical value judgment, obviously, would be that uh, things like suffering and premature death are bad. They're the kinds of things that typically we might want to prevent. Um, and there's a lot that you could say about how you compare those two. Um, suffering, uh, I guess, something that pretty much we, we, we would all agree is bad in itself. Of course, sometimes it might be worth going through some suffering in order to achieve a greater good or to reduce suffering overall, but just considered in itself, suffering is a bad thing. And uh, premature death generally, especially at least of beings who want to go on living or who are having good lives, happy or worthwhile lives, is also a bad thing. Not to say that premature death is always a bad thing if, for instance, it's the only way of stopping um, irre irre irremediable suffering, but, um, but generally it's a bad thing. Um, a third thing is that um, I said we're global humanitarians, but um, I should perhaps have said we're not only uh, concerned about human well-being either, we're also concerned to some extent about the well-being of non-humans who are capable of suffering, conscious beings, uh, which essentially means in the state of the world as we know it, non-human animals. We would be concerned about conscious aliens from another galaxy if we knew about their existence or could affect them, um, but we don't. So uh, practically this means um, we're concerned about animal suffering too. Um, there's some differences, I guess, in... I don't know anyone in the effective altruist, altruism movement who really says, I don't think animal suffering matters at all, but there are certainly a lot of people who say it don't, doesn't matter as much as the suffering of humans, and that's um, another discussion that's definitely worth having, how you compare the suffering of humans and non-human animals. And uh, there might well be debate about whether the deaths of non-human animals uh, is something that matters in itself. Those are further issues to talk about, but it, it does matter in some way. Um, next, and this might also be controversial, but it's um, one of the things that, that Holden puts out there. Um, he suggests that uh, things like justice, equality, and fairness are not intrinsically important. That's not to say they're not important. It might be very important to have a fair distribution of goods. I have to define what we mean by fair or just, of course, or equal. Um, uh, it might be very important to have it um, in terms of producing a society in which people feel that they're respected and valued, and it might also lead to the greatest overall utility if you distribute things uh, fairly. But um, we're not concerned, for instance, typically about achieving equality as such. Um, and it's important to remember that because often, especially if you're talking about an issue like reducing global poverty, um, and especially if you're talking about that um, in the United States, uh, people are very quick to jump to the conclusion that somehow you want to redistribute all of their wealth and you're some kind of, of socialist who wants to produce complete equality. And that's a caricature which obviously leads, makes it easy for people of a certain political uh, persuasion to dismiss what you're saying. But um, 
generally that's, that's not the case. Um, if we're concerned about global poverty, it's because we're concerned about suffering and premature death being bad, and um, we might be able to deal with that and uh, reduce that very dramatically, uh, a long way short of achieving equality or even what some people might think of as a just or a fair distribution. So that's in harmony with uh, essentially saying that um, the values of effective altruism are to a significant degree consequentialist. So we're concerned about the consequences of uh, what we're doing. And obviously if we talk about trying to make the biggest possible change for the better in the world, that's a consequentialist claim. Now, some people will then say, well, so does that mean that you're utilitarians? And then, just as with words like socialist, a lot of people have a whole lot of negative connotations about the term utilitarian that um, would mean that they would rush to find some implications of what you're saying that would clash with their intuitions or perhaps with your intuitions and um, would be a reason for not being an effective altruist. So... Um, you can obviously be a complete consequentialist. Um, I'm a utilitarian in, in my philosophy. Utilitarianism is uh, a name for one particular variety of consequentialism. Um, and I think that that's defensible, but it takes a fair amount of philosophical discussion to show that. And you can certainly say that, um, no, um, I think I want, to make, I want to make the world uh, a better place as far as I can, but I think that there are some basic constraints on what you're justified in doing in order to make the world a better place. So, for instance, you could say, I would never kill an innocent person just to make the world better in some ways, even if that saved a larger number of lives or reduced um, suffering by a very large extent. Um, you can certainly still be an effective altruist and recognize some constraints on what you would be willing to do what you think would be right to do along those lines. Um, but generally one of the, one of the things about um, thinking in consequentialist terms is that um, you do want to maximize expected value. You do want to maximize what you can bring about or what you probably bring, bring about um, given what you're, what you're going to do. And um, you're not so focused on things like um, do no harm or simply saying, well, you know, make sure you do some good. Um, those are, are generally not enough. Um, uh, so that's relevant in uh, a, a number of the questions that get discussed in effective altruism. You're probably aware that um, there's a view around um, that one of the good things you can do as an effective altruist is um, get a job where you're going to earn a lot of money so that you have a lot of money to give away. It's uh, put forward by uh, Will McCaskill on the website, um, 80,000 Hours, and it just recently has been written about quite a bit because of a Wall Street Journal article followed up by the David Brooks New York Times column and a number of other pieces uh, on that. So some people will say, look, if you're going to go into banking, let's say, in order to earn a lot of money to give away a lot of money, you're going to be complicit in harming people. Your bank is going to invest in projects that are going to uh, harm some people and somewhere or other along the line. So um, that's a reason why you shouldn't do it. Well, I think there is a, the, the consequentialist answer to that is um, partly, well, am I, if I don't take the job, will the harm still occur anyway? And if so, um, then does it really make a difference whether it comes through me in some sense or comes through someone else? And if conversely, if I don't take the job, there won't be a substantial amount of money going to save lives and prevent suffering or do other good things, um, then the trade-off is worth it. Um, you know, it's not a matter for me of saying, well, I've got to have clean hands. I'm going to make sure that evil doesn't come through me. Um, it's rather a matter of saying, what can I do that will make um, the biggest positive difference? And although, you know, I think one needs to be cautious, and as I said before, it's quite proper to have certain limits on uh, what you would want to go, you know, how far you would want to go with that, and uh, you need to be careful that you don't get corrupted by the culture that uh, you're working with. Um, I think that it's reasonable to say 
that you're more focused on doing the most, the greatest amount of net good than you're focused on the more absolutist or deontological rule that says you must not do harm or you must not be complicit in doing harm. So those are some of the, uh, as I say, some of the, what seem to me to be the, the basic values um, behind the movement and um, I think they're broad enough to be shared by people from a wide vari variety of philosophical positions uh, and for instance there are people in the effective altru altruism movement who come from a completely secular background and there are people who come from religious backgrounds of various kinds um, and I think that uh, we're, you know, the, the movement is certainly open to all of that. Now, um, I wanted to say a little bit, as I said in my introduction, um, about uh, building a movement and uh, the way in which uh, we ought to think about doing that because this is something relatively new and also because uh, this is a suggestion from Jeff actually uh, when we were emailing about what I might talk about because I've had some experience in um, building movements, not um, just in, in this one, which as I say has only recently really become a movement and uh, uh, in which I certainly haven't had a sort of detailed hands-on um, role in, in, uh, in that uh, to a great extent, although I'm working with uh, The Life You Can Save um, uh, to turn that into a, an organization. But um, going back to the 1970s, I was uh, involved in the animal movement through writing Animal Liberation, and there, since there was no radical animal movement, there was no people for the ethical treatment of animals or any other animal liberation or animal rights groups around really at the time, um, I did get involved in setting up a number of organizations uh, and so I had some experience, I guess, in, in building the movement there. And um, you know, there, there are a number of things one can say about that. Um, firstly, uh, I think you have to decide who you're trying to get to join and for that reason it's useful to have different organizations um, that have different kinds of, of pitches to people. Um, so just to give one example, as I mentioned, um, I've been involved with uh, The Life You Can Save, which in fact was developed from the book that I wrote with that title and then the website that was set up to go with the book. Uh, and there's a very similar movement called Giving What We Can. Um, and you might say, well, is there any point in having both of these movements out there, both of them organizing local groups or chapters, both of them concerned with encouraging people to give to relieve global poverty? And I think the, the answer to that is um, that they do have somewhat different pitches, and I think um, there is value in, in having them both. Um, I think that giving what we can makes a minimum demand that people pledge to give 10% of their income to effective organizations fighting global poverty. Um, and that means, I think, inevitably, that it's, it's going to be, at least for a while, somewhat limited in the number of people who are prepared to make that pledge to say, I'm going to give, the idea is to give for the rest of your life, at least 10% of uh, what I earn to relieving global poverty. Um, on the other hand, those who are part of that um, tend to be people who are very highly committed, people who are willing to work for the organization as well, to volunteer and so on, um, has significant appeal to um, student groups and is mostly organized around um, campus groups. The Life You Can Save has a more flexible kind of pledge um, because it's a pledge that starts out, you know, like a tax scale, starts out very low, um, suggests 1% and then goes... Uh, up from there depending how much you earn and um, we're even now after some discussions we're putting up a suggestion that well if you feel that the percentage that relates to your income is too much start somewhere and, and gradually work up to kind of um, achieve your personal best or surpass your personal best and keep working up idea so we're much more consciously making it easier for people to get started and um, uh, therefore we hope to have a larger number of people, and we do have a much larger number of people who've taken this, the pledge that we offer on the website, um, and uh, we're hoping to become more of a kind of mass movement. 
So I think there's, there's definitely scope for those sorts of differences. But the important thing is that we, you know, we, we cooperate where we can, um, we work together. Uh, there's not in any sense a rivalry, um, let alone any kind of antagonism between us. Um, we just see ourselves as, as complementary. And in fact, we're, we're both part of the Center for Effective Altruism, which is a kind of, um, I, I guess, umbrella or organizational structure uh, for what we're doing, um, particularly in the United Kingdom. So I think that that's an important thing to, to recognize, to go with the attitude that, yes, there are going to be a number of diverse organizations in the field. Um, sometimes I might think there's a bit of duplication and a bit of uh, unnecessary uh, work that goes on with this. You know, each organization has to apply for its charitable status. Each organization advertises at events. So I think what's important is that you recognize that you're all in the same field, that you're working uh, in a well-intentioned way for the same sorts of goals um, and that you cooperate wherever you can to, to save those duplications, to uh, avoid incurring unnecessary costs. Uh, um, but uh, I don't think you need to be troubled by the fact that there are a lot of different organizations out there um, with different ways of going about it. Um, and, and something that relates to that, I guess, a bit is um, the, the way in which you, you put your message. So I think from the sorts of things that are said among effective altruists and the sorts of things that you can see on uh, discussion boards and comments and so on, there are a wide range of views um, about the kind of issues that we ought to be talking about and um, or that we ought to be focusing on and putting our resources into. And I think that also has an effect on the extent to which we can hope to attract a reasonably wide public. So I, as you've noticed just from the examples I've been giving in uh, the time I've been talking now, um, I've put a lot of um, uh, a lot of my my examples and my uh, writing focuses on reducing global poverty, um, and I do that in part because I do think um, uh, reducing global poverty is a highly affected, highly effective thing to do. I think the expected utility of donating money to effective organisations that are working to reduce global poverty or to save the lives of um, people who are extremely poor and whose lives can be saved very cheaply compared to the cost of saving lives uh, in developed countries um, or providing them with better agricultural techniques or uh, education or whatever else it might be, um, that these are things that are highly cost effective. So I, I do that on the basis of what I think is, is good information about um, what we what, you know, what, what's a very reasonable choice to make. In other words, if you go into effective altruism and you say, this is, um, this is, this is what I want to do, I think it's, it's hard to argue that that's the wrong choice in terms of your, your time and dollars. Um, but it's also, and this is not um, an accident, it's also a choice that resonates with a broader public. I mean, it's pretty easy for people to understand that um, children die from preventable diseases like malaria or diarrhea or pneumonia um, in developing countries uh, that they would not die of if they were living in, in a developed country and that uh, we can reduce the number of deaths of children from those diseases uh, for, well, we can argue about how much, but anyway, not huge amounts of money, much less than we pay to save lives in our country, uh, and that that that's a good thing to do, or to prevent somebody going blind, for instance, that that's a good thing to do and we can do that reasonably cheaply, or to pre prevent a young girl having her life ruined by having an obstetric fistula once you know what that's about. These are things that, that grab people and help to bring them to the idea that, yes, they ought to be doing something positive with the resources that they have to improve the world. And I think you can contrast that with some of the other things that are also reasonable, defensible goals for objective altruism. So, for example, you, you can think about existential risk and uh, you can think about the sorts of discussions that the people involved with uh, singularity have. Um, but if you, if you start to 
talk to the person you happen to be sitting next to on uh, a Greyhound bus when traveling to a conference or somewhere, you start talking to them about, um, well, you know, don't you think we should put resources into trying to prevent artificial life um, being malevolent, artificial intelligence, sorry, being, being malevolent and taking us over, um, I think you're much li less likely to get a positive response than if you talk to them about, um, don't you think it would be good to save the lives of children who are dying of malaria in developing countries. So I think you need to be aware of that um, in thinking about, uh, if you like, what's, what's the public face of effective altruism. Um, I think you need to be, you know, th there's a danger always when you're mixing with other people who think like you do of being in a kind of, um, a kind of ghetto uh, where you think that the rest of the world is, is like the way you are. And um, that's very often not the case. I, I've seen the same thing happen in the, in the animal movement where um, you know, people, I think, have, unrealist, have had unrealistic objectives about what we might achieve um, because they've been talking to people who think like them and who are, you know, think it's as obvious as they do that uh, uh, the suffering we inflict on animals is wrong and unjustifiable and that nobody needs to do it and, you know, nobody needs to, to eat meat and therefore why don't we all change and so on. Um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's really good to, to get out into, as I say, you know, just, just the random public, the person you're sitting next to on a bus or, um, uh, you know, whatever else, other ways you might like to do that, put it out somewhere on, on the internet but not on a website that's only being read by people who look at this stuff. Um, and see uh, what kind of reactions you get. So I think that that's, um, that that's important and some of the discussions we have on, on um, some of those other questions like existential risk uh, I think can get very far removed from, from where people are at. So I'm not saying that these aren't um, important things that ought to be talked about somewhere. Um, uh, I'm not even saying that we shouldn't try to get people to think about this uh, at a public level and in fact that can and does happen and we want to start moving some of these other things that are now pretty fringe so that they eventually start to be things that we can talk about and accept and some of the, some of the questions within um, existential risk I think are easier for people to grapple with if you say look you know there's a danger that uh, uh, a large asteroid could collide with the Earth and uh, uh, wipe out um, all human beings or even all life on Earth. Um, and there are ways in which we could not only find out whether, you know, predict that whether that's going to happen or not, but develop rockets that could deflect the asteroid enough to so that it doesn't collide. Uh, you know, that's, that's something that people can relate to and I think that's something that people can say, well, yeah, you know, we ought to be doing something like that or... Um, uh, we ought to put some resources into that. The government ought to put some resources into that. And it is, in fact, you know, looking at some of those things. So there's, there's a whole spectrum of stuff out there. Um, similarly, I think in the animal movement, um, you know, it's the kind of thing, if you want to get the public involved, you can talk, obviously, um, people always were talking, I guess, about suffering to dogs and cats because uh, people relate to that. But most of the suffering that we inflict on animals isn't to dogs and cats. Um, it's, well, anyway, much more of it is to pigs and chickens, and factory farmed animals. So um, I think you can get people's sympathy for that. It's harder and it's probably easier for pigs than it is for chickens. Um, but you can get people's sympathy for that and you can start talking to it and you can start to move the factory farming issues to the mainstream. And I think the animal movement has been successful in doing that over the 40 years or so that I've been involved with it. Um, it has made factory farming something that far more people know about and far more people are ready to agree is a bad thing. Uh, on the other hand, some of the people in the EA movement are now talking about things like um, the suffering of insects um, and if insects do suffer then there's such a vast number of insects out there that it's conceivable that the suffering of insects is greater than the suffering of all vertebrates but you know how do we know whether insects can suffer? There's sort of philosophical questions about that and what will we do to prevent it. Again, I think it's, it's, it's not a good thing to be the public face of the animal movement or the public face of EA. It's something that people can talk about and maybe one day we'll get a better handle on whether insects can suffer um, and uh, we'll, people will be ready, you know, once, once we don't 
inflict so much unnecessary suffering on uh, mammals and birds and other vertebrates, people will perhaps be ready for thinking about um, the su whether insects suffer and whether there's something we ought to do about that. But um, I don't think I don't think that time has come. I think we're actually just starting to get some attention towards fish, which was something that, again, when I got involved with the animal movement, you couldn't really talk to people about fish. You know, they were cold and slimy and uh, they don't make any noises like um, dogs or pigs do when you hurt them. Um, so people didn't seem to relate to them very much. Um, so those are uh, some, of the, um, some of the things about, about how to build a movement that I think are, are worth thinking about. I do think it's important to get, to get out there and to get effective altruism uh, better known, to um, talk to more people there, to talk to people who are um, to some extent altruistic. I think part of the part of the market for developing um, a larger EA movement is people who have the, the A part but not the E part. Um, there's lots of people who say, oh, I give to charity. Um, and then you say, so, you know, what do you give to? And then they say, well, um, you know, there's some relative of mine, somebody in the family died of cancer, so I give to the local cancer hospital. Um, and, you know, once you get to that, you can say, well, you know, that's, that's nice, but um, do you know how much we, we spend to save a life in this country? Um, uh, can be hundreds of thousands, can be millions of dollars. And um, do you know that there are diseases that we know how to cure um, where we can, in developing countries, where we can save lives for a thousand or two thousand dollars perhaps rather than hundreds of thousands or millions and don't you think that uh, saving a life is good where, wherever it happens. So those are the kinds of discussions I think that you can have. People who are who are giving from the warmth of their heart um, but not really thinking very much about it and I see that as part of the um, kind of uh, audience that we that we have for our message. But I do think also we can bring other people into uh, the movement by emphasizing the effectiveness part. Um, in my conversations with people who are not giving, a lot of it is because they think that um, it's not going to do any good. Um, a lot of people have negative views about charities. Uh, you hear people saying something like, oh, it'll all get swallowed up by the administra administrative costs or um, if you're talking about helping people in developing countries, it'll all go to corrupt governments. Uh, and uh, I think there's plenty of evidence that that's wrong, um, that uh, you can certainly find uh, charities that uh, are making an effective difference by the most rigorous kind of scrutiny, the kind of scrutiny that GiveWell does. Um, and I think people need to know about this. Uh, it's unfortunate that there are some charities that are not effective, but in a way it's irrelevant. I mean, it's a pity that people give the money, but to somebody who's thinking about shall I give or shall I not give, it's irrelevant because obviously you don't want them to give to the ineffective charities anyway. All that's necessary is that there is one effective charity that they can give to. And I think that's something that you can clearly demonstrate. So I want to wind up so that you have um, time for the questions and discussion I mentioned. Um, just let me say that the other thing I think that we ought to be doing is um, talking openly about what we're doing and about what other people in the EA movement are doing. Um, that is uh, giving examples of people who are doing great things because there's lots of psychological evidence that people are more likely to help um, somebody if they see other people helping. Um, that uh, uh, you, know, you, can, you can do it in the kinds of experiments that uh, psychology uh, researchers set up with uh, stooges there and if there are stooges who rush to help then the person who doesn't really know that this is a fake accident will go to help if the stooges just sit around and go on with looking at their cell phones or whatever, this, the person who doesn't really know that it, what's going on is, is likely to not help either. And it's the same, I think, in this area. If you talk about what you're doing, if you talk about the fact that you're giving money away, you talk about that you're helping doing research to make it uh, effective, uh, you talk about people who are um, earning more in order to give more, if that's one of the things that you're interested in doing. I think it, it makes the whole thing more acceptable and I think it's part of what will be necessary for us to develop a critical mass where we start to see a lot of people moving into effective altruism and making a really big difference to the world. So let's, let me leave it at that. Um, 
and uh, I look forward to, to hearing from you in terms of what your questions and comments and interests are. No, I didn't really hear anything. It was just um, all static, so you're going to have to repeat. Speaking, like, come forward. Hey, can you hear me okay? Now I can hear you. Yes, that's good. All right. Uh, you mentioned net good. Uh, I'm just wondering what you mean by that. Is that lack of human suffering or just lack of suffering? Or is that maximization of quality of life? Or is it something else? So um, I think that... Um, you know, and this is my sort of utilitarian, simple, a little crude utilitarian definition of good is um, that it's the maximization of uh, a net happiness. So if you like, uh, positive experiences that conscious beings have, um, the, the greatest possible surplus of that over pain and suffering and uh, uh, undesirable experiences that they have. Now that's, that's a pretty crude way of putting it that goes back to Jeremy Bentham. Um, we could obviously talk about that a lot more, whether that's quite the right way of, of putting it or not. Um, and you could have other values. There are plenty of philosophers around who think, for instance, that things like uh, freedom or knowledge or autonomy are good things in themselves, not just because they promote happiness. But um, I think in terms of uh, practical consequences, um, for a lot of the things that I'm talking about, um, that's good enough. And in particular, I think um, it's important to focus on reducing the negatives because I think that while there are certainly some things we can do to make people who are already reasonably happy even happier, um, it does seem to me that all the evidence is that it's much more cost effective to help people who are um, in very difficult circumstances. And this is basically the the marginal utility idea that um, if, uh, as one organization called Give Directly is doing, you give people who are earning maybe $300 a year, that's their, their total income, if you give them $1,000, you've made a huge difference to them. You've given them three years income, they can do things that they couldn't do before, maybe uh, buy some corrugated iron so that uh, they live in a house where it doesn't uh, rain in every time it rains. Um, and, you know, that makes a much bigger difference for their family than $1,000 is likely to make to you. Uh, whereas if you gave that to somebody who was as well off as you, well, they could do much less with it. Uh, so, so that's why I think in practice, um, if you do have the kind of um, hedonistic, you know, happiness, uh, net, net surplus of happiness kind of view of good that I do, uh, it makes sense to focus on reducing suffering rather than on increasing happiness. And I think probably for most of the, the goals or values or you know, what it is that people would think to be good, uh, that would generally be so. Um, you know, if you think, want to think about human rights or something like that, you would think about helping people whose rights are being violated in the most grievous and egregious ways and therefore suffering the most from that rather than people who are reasonably well off but have some rights violations at least. That's the way I would think about it. What is next for you? Uh, what are your goals going forward? Oh, um, well, I'm, um, I'm hoping to um, continue to be uh, helpful for the effective altruist uh, movement. Um, the uh, next thing that I'm going to do in connection with that is I, I gave some lectures at Yale in April, a um, series of three lectures called the Castle Lectures. I, I'm not sure that they're online yet. They, they, I think they did an audio recording or maybe a video recording and they talked about putting it online, but I, nobody has told me that they've come online yet.
but it's kind of it's if you like it's a much longer version of the of the TED talk, um, and uh, part of the deal of doing those lectures at Yale is that you give Yale University Press a uh, a book length manuscript. So it'll be so I, I need to write them up and uh, refine them and do that. It'll be a, a shortish book, and uh, I hope it'll be out sometime maybe in the second half of next year. But I'm not 100 percent. Sure, I'll keep to that deadline. So uh, that's one thing that I want to do. Um, but I also just want to be uh, talking and writing about the movement in smaller ways, you know, um, to various audiences uh, who know probably generally less about it than, than you do, uh, to uh, student groups and other groups, and writing occasionally about it in uh, op-ed kind of length as well. Uh, so that's um, that's one of my goals. I certainly want to keep doing research into what are the best things that we ought to be doing and how can we better think about that. I think there are interesting philosophical questions um, as well as empirical questions about trying to work these things out, um, how we look at the judgments of, of uh, value. For example, I talked about how we compare animal suffering and human suffering. and There's a debate in the EA movement about uh, priorities there too about whether we can be more cost effective in trying to reduce animal suffering uh, than we can human suffering at the moment. Uh, so those are questions that I have a keen interest in and are practical as well as a philosophical interest and I want to keep doing, want to keep looking at them too. So you mentioned the, the usefulness of having Global, global poverty as basically the public face of the EA movement and having things like X risk and uh, other related ideas being sort of you introduce to people later. Um, I do agree that it's useful to have a public face that is as comprehensible as possible at first glance. Um, but I think it is not too difficult to craft a public image that's sort of a step between the two. When I was on the plane on the way here, uh, I was talking to the person sitting next to me, he was in high school, um, and he talked a bit about uh, where he was from. He used to, he was interested in science earlier in, earlier in his school career, and, but now he wanted to be a police officer so that he could help people. <laughs> and, I, uh, and I told him the story of Norman Borlaug, who uh, like developed, uh, since, uh, not, sorry, not for a while. We, we all know who Roll is. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, all right. So, I uh, told him a story about this guy who, first of all, has this really emotionally evocative story. He's just like, just a really awesome character. And, and saved somewhere between 200 million and a billion lives. <laughs> and uh, and the, this random guy on the plane found that pretty compelling. <laughs> right, good. Um, so, <laughs> you so, saved him from the police force, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so I think, I don't know that there are particularly good ex actionable examples for people that aren't like ready to gung-ho go into science or go in into like launch a, a technological innovative startup or whatnot. So I don't know, but for people that are sort of in a dilettante way, just wanting somewhere to throw a, a few thousand dollars around, um, if there's a concrete action, we can give them about that yet. But I feel like that's a reasonable goal for the next year is find sort of mid-level um, suggestions to people that, like in the case of Borlaug, you're, you have the exact same um, emotionally evocative image of the starving child in Asia or India or, or where have you, um, but it's accompanied with a much more empowering story, I think. Oh, absolutely. No, look, I totally agree with that, and I wasn't suggesting we should only face, you know, focus on individual children, because I think that can actually mean that we lose some highly cost-effective opportunities. Um, yeah, I mean, another good example that just comes to mind is, um, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you heard of, of Brian West, who's an effective altruist who's donating to um, developing in vitro meat, um, yes. which is yeah. sort of, you know, maybe it's a longish term thing, but um, it will, if it comes off, it can be economical, um, it will have a huge effect both in reducing animal suffering and in reducing the contribution that livestock make to climate change, which is very significant. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think there are many sort of easily conveyable ideas in, in science. If you have someone who's interested in going to science, say, well, why might you contribute to a scientific research idea that um, 
does have very high uh, expected value. Yeah. Thanks. Do we have an opinion what might be more effective? A, convincing altruists to become effective altruists, or B, becoming non-altruists to become altruists and effective altruists? Um, I think it's very hard to convince people who don't actually have even, you know, the altruistic motivation. Who, you know, there, there are some people you talk, talk about, I mean, happens more to me when I talk about the animal issue. There's quite a lot of people who say, look, I just don't really care about animals, you know, if they suffer well, doesn't, doesn't bother me, you know, I care about my other people. And, and there's a, a smaller number, but some people who say that about the distant poor as well, you know, look, I really care about my family and the people around me. And, and I find it very hard to move those people in a way I think it's kind of, it's unfortunate, but it's sort of a waste of time to spend too much time on them. We might eventually win one over. But, but on the other hand, if people say, look, yeah, I do care about um, people who are living in poverty elsewhere around the world, or I care about animals, but I don't think that I can really do much about it. It's such an, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's such an immense problem, you know, what, what will I do? It's in the ocean or whatever. I think, um, so those people are sort of altruistic but not acting on it. I think you, you can convince them, as I was saying, that there are effective things they can do, but they could be focusing on the difference they can make to specific individuals rather than on the total size of the problem, um, and that there are, you know, it's worthwhile getting into it. So uh, if you're talking about other people, I think um, you can move them into it. Yeah. But I do think also it is very important to talk to people who are already donating significant amounts, um, but not effectively. Um, perhaps that is really the most hanging fruit at, at this stage. And again, you know, not all of them are going to be easy to move either. Um, there was a picture just uh, over the weekend, I think, in the New York Times, I don't know if you, some of you have seen that, um, uh, about somebody who was talking about giving, um, giving to, uh, try to train a, a Guide dog for the blind, um, uh, and uh, that happens to be an example that I use in the uh, TED talk uh, about. You know, it's just for the cost of training one guide dog in the United States to help a blind person, it's something around forty thousand um, dollars. And uh, depending a bit on how you calculate the costs, you could actually prevent hundreds or maybe thousands of people coming blind from uh, conditions like trachoma in developing countries. So uh, you know. Well, I found out were pretty annoying actually as well. I look at it, um, but um, you know those are the kind of people that you would really like to reach and uh, say something about. Couldn't you think a bit more about being more effective? Um, what is your current view on population ethics? So, on under what circumstances is it good to create new people? Oh, uh, um, well, the the, the short. Philosophical answer to that is, um, I think if you can grab new people who will have um, good lives, so basically on balance happy lives in terms of what I said before, and will not have adverse effects on anyone else, um, that would be a good thing. Uh, anyone else, including on human animals. Um, now, that's not the world we're in, probably. Right? I think that um, for various reasons, uh, if you bring more people into existence. They may have a positive lives, but they're likely to have a lot of negative effects on others. So, um, my view of the present state of the world is that it's not a good thing in itself to bring more people into existence. Um, and therefore, I think it's worth doing things that will reduce the number of people who come into existence, whether that's making contraception more easily available or providing education for girls, which has been shown to correlate uh, inversely with the number of children that they will have. Um, or even uh, reducing child mortality seems to bring that. Uh, so, I don't have all the um, all these good things to do, uh, given the way the world is at present. But um, you know, otherwise, I do think it would be, in general, good if uh, if there could be more people living happy lives. It's not that I'm against large populations per se. I don't think that there's any benefit in that. Um, it's just that the present side of the world, I think makes that um, a difficult thing to do. One other thing I might add to that, because I know some people who are very much concerned with global problems and are altruistic, um, assume that the implication of that is that I should have any children myself. Um, 
I'm not sure that that is the implication. Um, it could be, um, but uh, I do worry a little bit about um, the sort of long, long run effect of people who are intelligent or altruists selecting not to have children. Um, whether you think that there's a influence through genetics or through upbringing, um, it may mean that we're, there are fewer of such people in the population future generation. Um, before we take our next question, um, the connection seems to be going somewhat slow, so I'm going to quickly reset the call. So we're just going to call you back on Skype. Um, okay, I'll give my uh, technical assistant first if he needs to do anything. Okay, um, I'll try video, and if not, I'll go to just audio. Can you okay. hear us? Any better now? It appears to be the same. So, no. Yeah, we t it, we're just hardwired, and this, this is the only one. Um, it does look a little better. Um, we're going to continue with video, and if the quality is too bad, we'll switch just to audio since it's more important to hear voices. Okay. All right, next question. I have two questions that are related. Um, so first, you wrote Famine, Affluence, and Morality in 1975 and The Life You Can Save in 2009. I'm curious, um, and The Life You Can Save, as I understand it, is essentially the same argument but for a different audience. And so I'm curious to wonder um, what accounted for the period in between. Uh, so why did you write it in 1975 and then, and then do the other one in 2009? And then also, um, it seems like the reception of um, both of the ideas, they were definitely presented in different communities, but the reception was very different uh, in both of those time periods. And I'm curious to hear your hypothesis of why uh, it maybe took longer for the ideas to disseminate into the larger population. Right, okay. So, um, the time I wrote Shannon Affluence and Morality, um, there were two different causes that I was interested in and I'd become aware of at about the same time. Um, one is the global poverty issue and the other is the animal issue. Um, now, uh, I wrote Shannon Affluence and Morality as an article, relatively short article, didn't take me very long to write it. Um, but um, when I thought about what should I be putting most of my time and effort and energy into now? Um, the answer seemed to me to be the animal movement. And, um, and this is something that came out in I'm glad you raised it. Um, but that's not because I thought that the animal movement in itself was necessarily a more important cause than the anti poverty movement. Um, I, uh, it may be, but it may not be. I, I didn't really try to make um, that judgment. But what I seemed to me clear was that at that time I could make a bigger contribution through the animal movement than I could through the anti-poverty movement. Because there were organizations already doing anti-poverty work, like uh, Oxfam and other organizations. There were other people who were talking about it, um, maybe not quite in the way that I was in that article, but there were people who were interested in it. Um, and yet the, and the animal movement um, really had nobody with any kind of, I thought, you know, real not only just not philosophical background, but really not much background that went beyond sentimental appeal to hunt puppies and kittens cute and shouldn't we stop being mean to them. Um, and so I felt that by finding animal operation, which was a bigger project, obviously a book, and then by getting involved in organizing organizations that could do this, um, I could make a bigger contribution than I could in the anti-poverty movement. Um, now that Peter, you know, that might explain Peter, why after the next few years second. anyway. Can you hear me? Uh, I can um, hear you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just gonna interrupt you for one second. If you can turn off your video, we'll leave ours on, and we think that that will improve the audio quality. But you'll still be able to see us. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks. Okay. Tell me if that works. Sorry. I'm I'm getting your audio fine, by the way. So it's just obviously. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah. Right. I think this is better. Good. Okay. So. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I then thought, I did write more things about global poverty, but they were also articles or a um, chapter in my book, Practical Ethics. Um, and, you know, in a way, I, to some extent, I felt, well, I've put this out there, 
But it's, it's not getting a lot of response. It's getting discussion among philosophers. The article is being read by students because it was getting frequently reprinted in kinds of uh, ethics anthologies that people use in teaching. Um, but it wasn't really getting a lot, of, a lot of response because I suppose a lot of people thought that, um, well, that whole scene is too messy and, again, as I was saying, too corrupt. And during the whole of the Cold War era, um, a lot of aid was really political, um, going to you know, the countries that are on our side. Uh, and I, you know, I, I sort of started to feel um, a few years before I, I wrote The Life You Can Save, I started to feel that things were tipping there, that um, there was a lot more serious thought going into uh, aid and, and how it could be made effective. There was more serious discussion of making it effective, of, of assessing its effectiveness to, you know, trying to, to do proper trials to tell whether it was effective or not. There was this new work going on that... Um, uh, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee were doing with a poverty action lab at MIT and then uh, and Givewell got set up there. I think I only heard about them when I was already writing the book. Um, so uh, I sort of felt, you know, now is the time to, uh, to write something uh, on this issue and to try to reach the broader public because, as you said, uh, Famine, Affluence and Morality was published in a philosophy journal. It got anthologized, but it never really got out of that sort of university scene in some way, the uh, philosophy scene. Um, then I guess the other thing that's relevant to this is uh, I took my position at Princeton in 99 and some of my opponents who were my opponents more for my views about euthanasia and bioethics than anything that we've been talking about um, did me a favour by protesting uh, the appointment, uh, picketing Pink Princeton and so on. Um, and that got me a lot of publicity and got me an invitation by the New York Times Sunday Magazine to write something for them. Uh, and I wrote a piece uh, that was called The Singer Solution to Global Poverty. That was their title, I should say, not mine. Um, a bit hubristic, but um, uh, uh, that had quite a lot of resonance. So that was, in a way, I, perhaps the first big piece that, was, that I wrote for a mass audience um, on that topic, a general audience. And it got a lot of a lot of response. I think they said they had 800 letters or something written in response, which um, in those pre-web days, or sort of pre-web days, um, was uh, was a huge uh, number of people actually writing in. Um, so I, I suppose it's from that time on, perhaps I started thinking about doing a book. But it did still take a few years for me to actually write it. And the response that so you asked about the difference in response. So the response I think has been. Uh, much better and much stronger. Um, that, uh, and I would attribute that to the fact that there's much more information there about aid, that people are thinking more seriously about it. Um, and also I think that even at the government level, people are making more of an effort to make aid effective, to uh, avoid just giving aid to corrupt dictators because they'll be on our side of the Cold War. Obviously that doesn't really apply anymore. Uh, and uh, so I think the climate there is, is much better for getting people to think positively about aid. Okay, before we take new questions, if anyone's previous question they felt wasn't answered because they weren't able to decipher anything, I want to give them a, a quick chance to ask for a clarification. Do you need to clarify? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's ask you a question one more time. <laughs> so, um, I didn't get the answer on the question whether we should um, have altruists become effective altruists or conform Confirm, oh, sorry, convert non altruists at all. So now I'm not sure whether you simply want me to repeat what I said because you, yeah. the audio was not yeah. uh, audible. Yeah, exactly. If you wouldn't mind repeating, that would be great. Ah, okay, sorry. Also, yeah. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. Yeah. You. That's okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, so my answer was that uh, I, I guess I divided people into really three categories. You have two categories, but I. Um, I'm suggesting that there are some people who are just not altruistic at all in their motivations. People who, when you talk to them about the suffering either of animals or of the poor, just say, I don't care, just leave me alone, I just want to get on with enjoying my life and maybe looking after people I love and care about. I don't care about animals, I don't care about people in Africa. Um, I find, in, in my experience, that they're too hard to work with. Um, too, much, too much effort required to get them to do anything positive. I'd say, at least for the moment, ignore them, try and isolate them, but forget about it. Um, so then you have people who are altruistic in their motivation, 
but um, think that uh, I can't really do anything. The problems are so huge, they're overwhelming. What can I do? I'm just one individual, it's hopeless. Um, or, you know, people who think, well, the aid organizations are all corrupt and it's not going to help. So them I think you can make good progress with um, because, you, can, you you know, there is a good empirical case for showing that even if there are some bad aid organizations, even if the problem is huge and they can't solve it all, they can make a difference to specific people or specific animals. They can prevent suffering. They can prevent premature death. And um, so I think you can get them to contribute. But probably the easiest, uh, probably the, the real low-hanging fruit here is people who are already giving, but are giving ineffectively. Um, people who are, say, are giving, um, I think I mentioned people who are giving to the local children's hospital because when their child was sick, the children's hospital did a great job of looking after their child. But, you know they're living in Palo Alto or somewhere, it's already one of the best hospitals in the world, uh, you know, the, the cost per life saved is, is over a million dollars, whatever, and I think for those people, um, you know, to point out that, look, you can save a life somewhere of for um, a thousand or a couple of thousand dollars is probably the most effective thing to do at the moment. So, um, uh, given the example of Norman Borlaug, um, is research more cost effective than, for example, the Against Malaria Foundation? Um, Borlaug's result would cost one or two trillion uh, at AMF's prices. Um, I think it, look, I don't really know the answer. I can't uh, do that calculation, but I, to some extent, to me, it depends on um, your tolerance of risk. Um, I think if you give to research, uh, it's quite likely that your money will do no good at all. Um, that you know it will be put towards something that turns out to be a complete dead end that isn't positive. Um, uh, whereas if you give to the Against Malaria Foundation, I think it's extremely likely that your money will do uh, some significant good, will save one or more lives. Um, but uh, you know, how you calculate whether, in fact, well, yes, you know, I have a one in a million chance of saving a million lives by uh, giving the same sort of amount of money that would save one life if I give it to um, uh, against my area foundation, in which case, you know, if that's the odds, then the expected value is about the same, or if you say um, I have a one in a million chance of saving 10 million lives, then uh, now, now the expected value is higher uh, with going into research. Um, I don't know how we can really decide that in advance. Um, obviously, you know, the people who supported Norman Bellock's research um, got extraordinarily good value for money. But was that predictable at the start? Not entirely, but, you know, was, was the, what could they say about expected value? That's one of the things that I think would be good to have more people looking at to see if we can get a, a better handle on it. Um, but again, it relates a bit to what I was saying about the public face of things. I think. Um, people would be, you know, ready to say, if you say, look, for a uh, thousand or two thousand dollars you can save a child's life, um, a lot of people would be willing to say that's good value. If you say um, for two thousand dollars there's a one in a million chance that you could save ten million people's lives, I think people are, oh, you know, well, you mean there's 999,999 uh, in, in, uh, chances out of uh, a million that it'll do no good at all, and you say, yes, I'm sorry, that's the odds. A lot of people will say, no, I'm not going to give. Uh, Eliezer Yudkowski here. I'm a subjective uh, expected utility maximizer, and I behave like an aggregate utilitarian with respect to our local galaxies. <laughs> um, I want to sort of like try and ask a relatively sort of pinpoint question here. Um, in my own reasoning, I usually try to make a sort of very sharp principled um, question, uh, uh, distinction between the questions of what is actually true in the real world and what can I explain to which audience. Um, part of the way I, I, I form that principled distinction is I ask myself, if this is true, how would I explain it? So like if I imagine, what if it's true about effective altruism that in the end, 
when the history books are written, it turns out that all of the net impact, like essentially all of the net impact from effective altruism came from it successfully propagating by telling the global poverty story, but 1% of the people it propagated to um, ended up aiding a scientific or technological project. Like, if, I imagine that if, that if you told me that exact fact, um, I'd probably keep the, the global poverty story on the front page, and then there'd be a link to um, the math behind the argument, and then that would have a link to science and technology, a risky thing of higher expected utility. And you get, and you continue to propagate through the poverty argument, but you'd, um, on the side, go through the science and technology thing. So my, my question is either, do you disagree with what I just said, in which case we should discuss that, or if you agree with it, what do you think about the pure facts of the astronomical waste, astronomical benefit argument? Okay. Yeah, that was very nicely put, I think. And um, I do agree with, with what you said, right? Um, I, I do agree that I think, uh, yeah, you want to expand the number of people who are receptive to the idea of effective altruism, and um, uh, a small percentage of them will start to think about um, other forms of effective altruism and what is really the best way to do. Uh, now, so what do I think about the astronomical waste argument? Um, so, uh, has this been discussed, by the way? Uh, do other people know what? I think it might actually be good to quickly summarize the astronomical Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the answer. Uh, have, did... um, it hasn't been discussed yet, but they asked for a quick summary. So, the very basic idea is you got all these galaxies within range of the telescopes that aren't going to go over the cosmological horizon by the time you reach them. So, in the end, um, if you value future experiences at all, um, most of the impact that we have on the net good of reality is the impact we have on future galaxies, and in particular, does humanity survive to colonize them? Are they colonized by good people? There's just no way anything on the Earth can compete with all those galaxies, is, is the sort of rough idea there. Right. So, yeah, and just to, just to add to that a little bit, um, uh, so there's a guy, there's an Oxford philosopher called Nick Bostrom who has a paper um, using that, that title, um, and he has these enormous numbers in it about, you know, the, if, if we had um, uh, a billion people living for a billion years, um, uh, or maybe even imagines we develop uh, ways of having vastly larger populations because maybe we can uh, embody minds in software or something like that. So you have these vast numbers of people who are living very happy lives for vast numbers of time, and then he comes out with something that says something like, so even if you only have, uh, uh, and, and obviously for this to happen, the spe our species needs to survive for the next uh, whatever it will take, century or two, for us to develop the technology to colonize these other inhabitable planets in other galaxies. Um, so if you can do something that reduces the risk of human extinction during that sort of century or two bottleneck period um, by even, uh, I don't know, a, 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 a billionth of one percent, that would still do a lot more good than anything that you might do in terms of reducing global poverty or a lot of, or a lot of other issues today. So I think it's a very ingenious argument. I have a lot of respect for, for Nick Bostrom. He's a very smart guy. No question about that. Um, I find the figures a little hard to credit, really. Um, how those calculations are uh, achieved, and uh, you know, it's very that uh, you've excluded various other things that might happen that might go wrong. Um, it's it's just kind of it assumes optimistically that that you know, once we have better technology, then we'll know how to make everything great. Um, and uh, so, I'm I'm somewhat skeptical about the actual calculations, but I do think. Um, and one other thing that I want to say is a lot of people do jib at the idea that it's as important to produce more happy beings in future, which is what we're talking about, uh, as it is to reduce the suffering of a being who's existing right now. And that's a, a difficult philosophical question, actually, that's, that's, that Bostrom is assuming that it is for most, most of what he does. He does consider other possibilities at the end of the paper. Um, so uh, there could be a philosophical difference there, too. 
But I think the argument is intriguing. Um, I do actually tend to agree that um, reducing X risk is extremely important um, and is worth thinking about, um, particularly where we have a good sense of what will reduce X risk. And that's why I'm a little more sympathetic to uh, money going into the asteroid deflection program than I am to some of the other things where it's really harder to know that we're making a difference in the right direction by, by what we do at this stage. Um, but I certainly do think that, um, yeah, X risk is a significant part of uh, EA and it's a very good thing if a proportion of the people who are in EA uh, start to think really seriously about that and uh, about how to make a difference. Um, I'm just looking at the time and I think I'm going to have to wind up because I do have another commitment that I have to go to. So um, I've enjoyed the discussion. I, I hope that you have. I'm, I'm sorry if there are other people who would have liked to ask uh, questions um, at some time, but uh, I do have to wind up. So I guess I, I think I speak for everyone here when I say um, we really appreciate your time. Um, it was a really inspiring talk. Uh, hopefully you can connect with whoever still had questions. And uh, thank you. You've done really inspiring work. Right. Okay.